Well, last class, we ended with Saul's unsuccessful attempts to kill David in the line of battle. Every time he put David out there on the battle line hoping that he would die, he ends up just being more victorious and his reputation only increased, which is the exact opposite of what Saul wanted to happen. Well, up to this point, Saul's plots to kill David were kind of all in his head. They were not made public yet. They were all private to him. But in this chapter, in chapter 19, where we're going to pick up with tonight, he goes public with it, and he starts to hire people, even his own son Jonathan, to kill David. Now, I want to make a couple notes about some overarching themes that we'll see throughout the rest of 1 Samuel that really make David a, a powerful foreshadowing of Jesus. Um, First of all, serving the Lord means you will likely suffer at the hands of those who don't. And we're going to see that a lot. David is going to be suffering a whole bunch at the hands of Saul, on the run, escaping for his life, not really feeling like he has a place to call home. And it's through no fault of his own, other than the fact that God has appointed him and not Saul. And he's going to suffer for that. And also what we're going to see, especially tonight, I want to use this verse to set the tone for tonight's class, is that choosing to align ourselves with the Lord's anointed can create a divide in our family relationships. Jonathan is going to find this out the hard way. And I think about what Jesus said in Matthew 10, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, for I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. I bring those points up because as we read these events, it's important for us to put ourselves in the shoes of David and really think about what it would feel like to go through what he was going through and put ourselves in the shoes of Jonathan, who, when he aligns himself with David, when he aligns himself with the Lord's anointed, watch the deterioration in his relationship with his father as a result of that. And it's really sobering and it's really encouraging to see the faith of these men through these trials. So 1 Samuel 19 is where we begin in verses 1 through 7. Let's just read verses 1 through 3 to start. Now Saul told Jonathan his son and all his servants to put David to death. But Jonathan, Saul's son, greatly delighted in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, is seeking to put you to death. Now, therefore, please be on guard in the morning and stay in a secret place and hide yourself. I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you. If I find out anything, then I will tell you. Now, I imagine all of you have a best friend in your life. I don't know if you would classify it as closely as David and Jonathan, that you're knit to the soul of that person. Uh, But maybe that is the case. We all have a best friend in our life. Now imagine that your father orders you to murder your best friend. That's what happens here with Jonathan. And that puts Jonathan in this horrible situation because he kind of has to choose between his father and David. If he protects David, then his father is going to be angry with him, but he's not going to kill his best friend. So he at least thinks of a way to not have to choose right now, to not have to take sides, to kind of minimize the divide, and that is by having a logical, reasonable conversation with his father. And one of the several of the things that he says to Saul about why he shouldn't kill David, why this is an illogical Kind of an irrational, unfair order. All right. All right. He killed Goliath. He basically saved Israel. You're about to kill the Savior of Israel. All right. That's completely um, illogical. And think about it. Goliath wasn't the only way that David benefited Saul. David benefited Saul in other ways, too, playing the soothing music for him, going out and winning other battles for the Israelites, for the Israelites and Saul's going to kill him. What else is, uh, what are some other things he says about he's that? Innocent. Yeah, he's innocent. So 
as a king, you're supposed to uphold justice in the land. You're supposed to defend those who are innocent and punish the guilty. But if he, as a king, kills somebody who is completely innocent, well, he's dispensing with justice, which is one of his primary jobs as, as king. And, you know, it's not just about innocent blood. It's also he hasn't sinned against you. He, he's done you absolutely no wrong. And it seems like Saul actually listens to Jonathan, at least momentarily, temporarily, and he makes a vow not to kill David. He says in verse 6, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. But again, it was only a temporary concession. Now, I, I think probably he makes this concession because he realized using Jonathan to kill David, it's not going to work. He's going to have to find another way. In fact, at this moment, Saul cuts Jonathan out of the loop. All future plans to kill David, not going to say a word to Jonathan about it. Which is why in chapter 20, look real quick at verse 20, uh, or excuse me, <laughs> chapter 20, rather, verse 2 in chapter 20, David comes to him, to Jonathan, panicking because Saul wants to kill him. But then Jonathan says to him in verse 2, Far from it, you shall not die. Behold, my father does nothing, either great or small, without disclosing it to me. So why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. What Jonathan doesn't realize is that in chapter 19, the rest of the chapter we haven't got to, Saul tries to kill David like another five times. But he doesn't tell Jonathan. Because I think after that conversation with Jonathan, he realizes I can't trust him. He's not really on my side. He's on David's side. Some applications here. We need the courage, like Jonathan, to stand up for what's right and to try to talk, pe talk to people logically about doing uh, the right thing. But when someone's heart is set on something, logic will only take you so far. Sometimes it doesn't matter how beautiful our conversations are and how we lay out the gospel message in such a clear and concise way. If people's hearts are set against the Lord's anointed, Jesus, they might be convinced for a second. You might, you might have a glimmer of hope. Maybe this person's going to change. But if their heart is set against it, it's really not going to work. And that's what happens That's what happens here. It kind of looked hopeful. It looked like Saul was changing. I promise. I'll never, you know, David will never be put to death. But then as we continue to read, well, he really goes back on that. He doesn't take that vow very seriously. Any other com comments or thoughts through verse 7? Any questions, Adam? A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Yeah, very good. That's a, that's a phrase I've carried around, saying I've carried around for most of my life. Mm -hmm. It's so, so true. I think I think Saul sees that it's true. He he knows what's right, in this, yeah. but he's not going to do it. Yeah, that's that's a great that's a great point because sometimes we we make the mistake of thinking, well. Maybe, I, maybe it's my fault. I just didn't explain it well enough. <laughs> uh, maybe I, I wasn't logical enough in my approach, and that's why this person doesn't listen to me and become a Christian. Well, there's so much more than logic going on. There is will. And like Adam says, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And that's, that's how it is with Saul. And I will also say, keep in mind this is a father-son relationship. And we can talk to our families, but many times our families are the hardest to convince. And they're going to start to notice if we start to take a logical approach and we start to talk about Christianity, they're going to start to kind of not trust that we're on their side anymore. They're going to start to see kind of like this small divide starting. It's going to get much worse in chapter 20, but it kind of starts here <coughs> between Saul and Jonathan, this small divide. Where our families may think, ooh, you know, he's, he's kind of gone off the deep end here. She's kind of gone off the deep end here with this, this Christianity stuff. And this is what's happening in this family dynamic. Well, there's more fi family 
dynamics that go on in this chapter. Because again, that vow was short lived. And now we come to verse 8. And it says in verse 8 When there was war again, David went out, fought with the Philistines, and defeated them with great slaughter, so that they fled before him. Now there was an evil spirit from the Lord on Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing the harp with his hand. And Saul tried to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence so that he struck the spear into the wall. And David fled and escaped that night. Then Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him in order to put him to death in the morning. But Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be put to death. So Michael let David down through a window, and he went out and fled and escaped. Now, we're not sure exactly how long between Saul's vow not to kill David and this event. But once again, this miserable spirit uh, is in Saul, and he tries to kill David again for the third time now with a spear. He tried earlier in a different chapter twice, and David escaped twice from him. And it's amazing David keeps going back. Uh, But again, maybe he thought, hey, he made this vow to Jonathan. It's fine. Well, Saul doesn't keep that vow. He throws this this spear at him, and he escapes once again. And so this time Saul says, well, I'm going to send my servants. I'm not going to send Jonathan. can't trust him. But I'll send my servants to go and surround David's house, kill him in the morning. And now you have another division in the family. Because apparently, and I'm calling her Michael. It's it's Michal in Hebrew, and I really don't want to say that over and over again. So... (laughs) Um, I know Michael is typically um, a male name, um, but I'm just going to call her Michael here for the sake of ease. And first, Saul's son Jonathan defends David. Now, Saul's daughter is defending David. She lowers him out the window so he can escape. And what's her plan to make the servants think David is still there? She put an idol in the bed and added a goat wig. Yeah, she takes this household idol, this teraphim in Hebrew, and apparently this particular one must have been a life-size idol. And unfortunately, we don't know much detail, because what's what's everybody thinking about this right now? What's the question on your mind? Why is there an idol in David's house? Um, I don't know. (laughs) We don't have the answer. David is never really charged with idolatry in the the Bible. He's never condemned for this. Nathan doesn't come to him and say, hey, and by the way, you know, on top of the Bathsheba thing, you had that idol in your house. There's nothing that the text really says about that. Uh, Apparently it was hers, though. Michael had no problem using it, though I will say she used it for about all that it was good for, and that is to look like it was alive but it's really dead. And it worked because, the so, well, it would have worked until the soldiers walked over and saw what was really going on, but they saw this, she had made this quilt of goat's hair, which was probably black, and so it looked like someone was laying in that bed. And at first, they didn't really check the bed. I mean, they came to the door, she just said, well, he's sick. You know, maybe she just thought she had the vaporizer going and kind of, kind of made them think that he's ill and just classic thing, and they... They go back to Saul and say, well, look, he's sick. And hilarious request by Saul. What does he say? Yeah, just just lift his bed. I don't care if he's in bed. You take the bed with him on it, and you bring him to me, and I'll kill him. That's how maniacal uh, this, this guy is. And that's when, of course, they find out that this was all a ruse, that this is an idol in the bed. And uh, now Michael is in a trap like Jonathan is kind of in a trap but she doesn't handle it the way Jonathan did she cowers before Saul Saul says how in the world could you support my enemy and how does she defend herself blame David yeah right so couldn't she have done the same thing Jonathan did shouldn't she have done the same thing Jonathan did and said yeah, yeah, I defended him. I lowered out the window because he killed Goliath and he's never done you any harm and it's wrong to kill him. She doesn't do that. Instead, she lies about David. Did that, did that lie help David at all, you think? No, I think it would made things worse for David. Because the lie was, well, David threatened my life. I had to let him go. He said he was going to kill me. So now you have this 
maniac of a man, Saul, who you've just given him an excuse. You've just given him some ammunition against David. Well, now I'm really going to kill him because he threatened my daughter. <clears throat> Sometimes that's the way it is with lies. We think that we're lying to help somebody, when in reality, many times our lie only hurts the person that we are claiming to protect, and we're really just saving our own skin. That's why we're, that's why we're lying. And this is what happens here. And a good application is that we need to take ownership of what we believe. You know, if we, if we believe something is right and, and stand, up, stand up on that belief, when somebody confronts us and challenges us with that belief, well, we shouldn't cower. Uh, like what Adam said on Sunday in his sermon, believe your beliefs. You know, it's easy to believe our beliefs until someone challenges them or there's some consequence for believing that belief. But Michael does the wrong thing here. If Think about it. If she really believed David was innocent and had no right to be killed, she should have owned that, stood up to her father. But again, let me say, family dynamics are difficult. It's, it's hard to stand up to our parents well, when they believe something have different. Been in big trouble with her father. She would have been in big trouble. There's no doubt about it. And I don't know. I don't. Saul may have tried to kill her. I, I don't know what he would have done. Um, he didn't kill Jonathan when Jonathan made those arguments. But she obviously was fearful that, yeah, maybe he will kill me, so I need to lie. She did not feel like she had enough faith or courage to, to stand up. And I will tell you, it is sometimes the hardest with family members to stand up for what you believe in because you feel such pressure um, to, to conform to what they believe. And it's easy for me to look, for us to look and say, oh, Michael, she's just wimpy. How could... But, man, that, that's a really hard, hard situation. Yeah. Chloe. I was going to say, maybe she, I don't know if she saw the situation with Jonathan um, and, like, what had happened and his reaction, but it could also be, like, she feared for her life because not only is Saul, you know, crazy at this point, but, um, Female children couldn't carry on a family name. So a lot of the time, you know, you wanted a male child. So it could have been that she not only feared for her life because she helped his enemy, but then, you know, with Jonathan, there's more of a reason to keep him alive. And Michael could have felt, you know, there's no reason for me to be here. I've helped David, and now my father's going to kill me. Because, okay. And he's not, and so hasn't shown anything that he would like to save. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, those are good points. Yeah, maybe she uh, is a little bit more dispensable since she's not kind of carrying on that, that family name. That's a good point. Yeah. Well, be, he, either way, he, she should have had faith and trust in God. Seems to me, because he was a boy, he would have been his father's after his father was gone, but he would have been yeah, the king, yeah. not his yeah. friend. Yeah, absolutely. Jonathan is next in line the throne and David is a threat to that to Saul but he's not a threat to that for Jonathan because Jonathan loves him and has you know has a heart a heart for God yeah good good points now let, let's imagine that you're David you have to leave your home our home should be the place of greatest safety and refuge at least from a physical standpoint right our homes are our castles right we say you know the world's scary out there and it's it's hard to really go through life sometimes with all the challenges, but boy, when we come home, you know, it's nice to just feel like, ah, okay, I'm okay. Can you imagine you go home and there are enemies surrounding your entire house and they want to kill you in the morning? Not very relaxing. <laughs> Not much of a castle at that point, and David has to flee. He has to leave his home. Not only that, he has to leave his best friend, Jonathan, and he has to leave his wife, <laughs> whom he loves dearly. So David is in this incredibly vulnerable position of feeling like there is no safety for him. There is no place of refuge for him on this earth. And it's with that background in mind that he wrote Psalm 59 by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So look in Psalm 59. And again, as we study through this, we're just going to look at some of the Psalms and where they fit in. Of the 150 Psalms that we have, there are only 14 of them that provide titles underneath to explain the historical situation at the time of writing, and this is one that has a title. Um, it says, for the choir director set to Al-Tashheth, which let me say something about that. 
the, this was the Jewish songbook. And so Al Tashheth was the name literally do not destroy. It was probably the name of a familiar song that they knew. And so this psalm would be set to the tune of Al Tashheth is what that means. Our songbooks do the same thing. When you flip back, you might see like Psalm, I don't know, I'm making this up, Psalm 25 or something, set to the tune of, I'm not ashamed to own my Lord. Well, we may not know the psalm very well, but we know the tune, and so we start singing that psalm to that tune. That's the same way they would do with these. But right after that, he says, it's a miktam of David when Saul sent men and they watched the house in order to kill him. So here we see verses 1 through 3, deliver me from my enemies, O my God, set me securely on high, away from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from those who do iniquity, save me from men of bloodshed, for behold, they have set an ambush for my life. Fierce men launch an attack against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. You know, David's life has literally been ambushed at this point by his enemies as they're surrounding his, his house, um, and he's completely undeserving of it. Now, I'm not saying that he wrote this while he was in his house or anything like that, but he's thinking back on that situation. And then in verse 6, continue how he talks about his enemies. He says, they return at evening, they howl like a dog, and go around the city. Behold, they belch forth with their mouth. Swords are in their lips, but they say, who hears? But you, O Lord, laugh at them. You scoff at all the nations. Because of your strength, I will watch for you. For God is my stronghold. My God in his loving kindness will meet me. God will let me look triumphantly upon my foes. So David kind of compares his enemies to these scavenging dogs that are just wandering around, howling, looking for whatever they can eat. And David is their prey, essentially. But then he says, God laughs in their faces, and he's going to give me victory over them. And he continues down, um, look at verse 13. He says, destroy them in wrath, destroy them that they may be no more, that men may know that God rules in Jacob to the ends of the earth. Drop down to verse 15. They wander about for food and growl if they're not satisfied, but as for me, I shall sing of your strength. Yes, I shall joyfully sing of your loving kindness in the morning. For you have been my stronghold and a refuge in the day of my distress. O oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you, for God is my stronghold, the God who shows me loving kindness. I want us to appreciate a few things about this psalm. First of all, David says several times that God is his stronghold and his refuge. And doesn't that really come to life when you realize that he's been chased out of his own home? His, home, his house should be his stronghold and his refuge from his enemies, but it's not. He's chased out, but God becomes that. Even when we have nowhere to lay our head on this earth, we are always safe in the arms of God. Secondly, did, did verse 8 sound familiar like any other psalm? Verse 8. Any psalm come to mind? Psalm 23. How so? I don't, on verse 8, the Lord laughing at them. Yeah, I'm speaking about setting the table and before his enemies, but maybe that's a little bit different. Oh, okay. That's a good point. That, yeah, okay, that's great. Um, that is a sense in which God mocks the enemies. I didn't think about that connection. Um, probably a lot of different psalms, but there's one I'm thinking of in particular about the Lord's anointed and the nations gathering against them. Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Remember, that's the one that says in verse 2. In fact, just look there real quick. Psalm 2 and verse 2. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. So you guys made good connections. with. You said Psalm 23, you said Psalm 22, and I think those are good connections. This one specifically says he laughs and he scoffs at them. And so it kind of brought to my mind that, that psalm, especially because... Saul is now one of those kings that has taken his stand. He's a king of the earth that has taken his stand against the Lord and his anointed. And when you read the narrative, you see the Lord kind of laughing and making a mockery of Saul. 
over and over again for his rebellion. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Saul tries to kill David with a spear, and he escapes three times. He tries to kill David by sending him to the battle lines. David wins again. He tries to hire his son to kill David. His son takes David's side. He sends other men to kill David, and he's tricked, and he's lied to by his own daughter. And then the rest of 1 Samuel 19 is going to end with more of God's laughter as Saul is humiliated like three or four more times by the Spirit of the Lord. And finally, this psalm in Psalm 59 paints David as an innocent sufferer for God. I think one of the key purposes in 1 Samuel is to show that David never usurped the throne. He never wronged Saul. He never deserved such ill treatment. That would help legitimize him as king with a man after God's own heart, and it would foreshadow the ultimate sufferer, Jesus, who suffered unjustly for his devotion to God. Jesus never usurped the throne or became king by questionable means. He was anointed and lifted up by God. Any questions or comments about Psalm 59 and what we've read so far in chapter 19? Yeah, it sounds very similar to Jesus' story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He comes from this line of people. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, there's so much foreshadowing of Jesus and David. And I'll say this about the Psalms. I mean, they are such a tremendous comfort in times of suffering. If you are suffering, open the Psalms because many of them were written during times of great trial by David, whether it was based on him getting chased down by Saul or later him getting chased down by Absalom and run out of his own city and chased off the throne. He goes through so much suffering, and yet he always turns to the Lord as his refuge. It's such a good lesson for us uh, to keep faith in God even when times are difficult. But I fear sometimes it's just hard for us to relate because there's not much suffering that we go through in this country. We're so blessed with so much peace. We don't have Saul's and Absalom's running around chasing us down. But that may change someday. And maybe the Psalms will take on an even more, um, an even greater and deeper meaning for us. All right, well, David, as we continue in Psalm, or Psalm, in uh, 1 Samuel 19, he flees uh, to Samuel's town, Ramah, for safety. He flees from Gibeah, which is the place where Saul lived. You can see Gibeah underlined there with the star on the map, and he just went up northwest there to Ramah. And he was taken in at a place called Naoth, which most believe was a place where the prophets lived. Um, it's where Samuel lived and where a group of other prophets uh, would have lived. And Saul is humiliated again because he sends messengers to Naoth to go and grab David. And what happens every time his messengers go to get David? Well, yeah, the Spirit of the Lord comes on them. And they just start prophesying. It seems like, you know, we kind of make fun of the charismatic movement where people are just uncontrollably flopping around on the ground. It seems like that's kind of what was going on here. And that's a very rare occasion in Scripture. Um, and rightly so, that, that doesn't happen today. But here, God does seem to be controlling them in some way against their will, and they start prophesying. I don't think Saul's messengers chose to, to prophesy, but God makes them prophesy through, through his spirit. And uh, Saul does that three times, sends three messengers, and then apparently he has the attitude, you know, if you, can't, if you want to get something done right, you got to do it yourself. And so he said, well, I'm going to go there myself and get David. And, and then God sends his spirit on Saul, and he starts prophesying uncontrollably as well. And he even strips off his outer garments, his kingly garments, and lays there prophesying all day and all night. Now... I can't claim to know all that's going on in this passage and why, you know, why God is, is doing all of this in this way. But I will make a couple interesting points about this to consider. First of all, this is another occasion where God is kind of laughing at the enemies <laughs> that try to stop his anointed from being king. Saul has absolutely no power to stop David from being king. God just snaps his fingers, sends his spirit, and Saul is completely under under God's control if, if he wants. And I would also say, since he's 
strip these kingly garments off of him. That's just another piece of symbolism that God is taking the kingdom away from Saul. It's like earlier when Jonathan takes off his you know, robes and, and gives them to David voluntarily. Here, here Saul once again is being stripped by the Lord and not by his own will. And let me say this too. Maybe God uses this method because normally if a person travels to Ramah to see Samuel and the prophets, what are they looking for? The word of the Lord. They're looking for a message from God's spirit through the prophets. But that's not what Saul came for. He came to kill. He came to murder God's anointed. So God gave him what he really should have been coming there for, and that is to listen to God's word. Even though he didn't choose to come and listen to the spirit of the Lord, God sends the spirit of the Lord upon him against his will. Um, and I will say this last part, is Saul also among the prophets? That's only used twice in the Bible. It was used one other time at the very beginning of Saul's reign, when he first became king. And it seems like because it became a proverb, it was almost like an expression to describe when something extraordinary happened. Because in chapter 10, Saul was not a prophet. He was you know, a king, and he wasn't supposed to be prophesying. So when he starts prophesying, people marveled at that. And they said, what, Saul also among the prophets? And you could, also, you could almost see whenever something extraordinary happened in their life, they would maybe say that saying. Hey, is Saul among the prophets? And it would kind of call to mind that, that amazing sight. Well, here it's being used again, but in a negative sense. <laughs> you know, the first time it was used, it was a good thing. It was like, wow, is Saul also among the prophets? Here it's kind of like, you know, why is this man who's so set against God and has this evil spirit and is, you know, angry? And is, he, is he among the prophets too? It's almost like a, a sad commentary, like a bookend on Saul's reign as king. Any comments or thoughts on, on that very interesting section? I wish I knew more detail about why all that happened. But. I think I'm going to adopt that new saying anytime something shocking or surprising happens. I think that's all among the prophets. I think that'd be all great. All you guys will understand me. Yeah, I think that'd be, that'd be good. Most people would probably have no idea what you're talking about. But, <laughs> but we will know. We would know. Um, well, let's get to the last chapter then, where Jonathan warns David. Once David realized that Saul found him there in Ramah, he now goes back to Jonathan. And he says, what is the deal with your dad? Why does he hate me so much? Why is he so bent on killing me? And that's when Jonathan, who's been kept completely in the dark by his father, totally out of the loop, says, I don't what are you talking about? He's not trying to kill you. My dad doesn't do anything without talking to me. Well, David knows better. He's been on the run for his life from, from Saul. And Jonathan says, well, look, you know, I'll find out whether or not this is true. And David kind of gives him a plan to find out, okay, I just want you to see for yourself that your dad is a maniac and he's trying to kill me. And so they come up with this plan where they're going to go to the New Moon Festival, which happens once a month. Apparently there was a, a feast that would be held with the king and his servants, and David doesn't go. And so when Saul recognizes that the seat is empty, well, there's two reactions you'd have. When he asks where David is, Jonathan has this plan to deceive him, and you know the Bible doesn't really comment positively or negatively on that, um, so I don't know if I want to go there on that with his deception. Not sure that was the right thing to do here, but he says, look, David went home. He's offering sacrifices, and if Saul says, oh, that's okay, no big deal, then they'll know that David's safe. But if Saul gets angry, well, then they'll know Saul is hunting for David's life. And then they had to create a signal because David says, well, how am I supposed to know what your dad says if I'm not there? So Jonathan says, well, listen, I'll go out in the field. I'll take a lad, a young lad with me to collect my arrows. And I'll go out in the field like I'm going to do target practice. I'm going to shoot three arrows. And then I'm going to say something to my servant who's collecting my arrows. And apparently David would have been in earshot of this. He was hiding out there in, in the field. And if he said, hey, the arrows are next to you are to the side of you, and go, go over there and pick him up, well, then David would know that he was safe. But if he said, the arrows are beyond you, you need to keep walking, go further, and pick up the arrows, then David would know 
he is indeed in danger. So they go through this whole thing, and Saul does get angry. But that anger takes a startling turn. Because look in verse 30. Look in verse 30 what happens. Then Saul's anger burned against Jonathan. And he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you are choosing the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Therefore now send and bring him to me, for he must surely die. But Jonathan answered Saul his father and said to him, Why should he be put to death? What has he done? Then Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him down. So Jonathan knew that his father had decided to put David to death, and then Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and did not eat food on the second day of the new moon, for he was grieved over David because his father had dishonored him. So what started out in chapter 19 as Saul not being able to trust Jonathan has turned into full-blown hatred of his own son. And he, because Jonathan aligns himself with David, Saul treats Jonathan just like he treats David by throwing a spear at him to try to kill him. And Saul cannot understand why Jonathan would take his side. Don't you know, Jonathan, if you let David live, then he's going to take your kingdom from you? But Jonathan chose God's anointed over his own father. Jonathan literally sought God's kingdom first. He didn't seek his own kingdom like Saul did. He sought God's kingdom and the righteous man that God had decided to put on that throne, and it nearly got him killed. Jonathan was willing to give up his relationship with his own father. He was willing to give up his own kingdom and was willing to suffer alongside David in service to the Lord. And the beautiful thing is, by aligning himself with David, he... He also arranged safety and peace and security for himself because earlier in this chapter, he makes a covenant with David in verses 14 through 17, and David promises to take care of his descendants in the future. You know, most of the time when a new king was in town, it was time to purge and murder everybody in the royal family that preceded you, kind of in with the new, you know, out, out with the old, in with the new, but it wasn't going to be like that for David when he reigned. And we see that when we align ourselves and enter covenant with the Lord's anointed, there is only safety and peace and loving kindness for us, despite all the things that may come along and the pain and suffering that may come along with aligning ourselves with him. And this chapter ends with David on the run again, having to say goodbye to Jonathan. They're weeping because of that separation, but they're also rejoicing because they have this covenant relationship with one another. I think... The last application that can be made is that we may have to give up our own kingdom to seek Jesus' first. And when we do that, we'll suffer alongside him sometimes by the hands of our own family members. But there is nothing like the security and blessing of being in a covenant relationship with the Lord and his anointed. Any comments or questions about anything that we've studied tonight? <clears throat> Ten more seconds of awkwardness. <laughs> You'll read through page 34, the start of page 34. Thanks, Henry. You cut it to six seconds. That was great. Uh, and for next time, read through 34. Appreciate uh, your kind attention.